So, good afternoon. Welcome to lecture five. Time really flies, doesn't it? It's lecture five already. Uh, so, I owe you, let's dim the lights. I owe you uh, the last part of uh, talking about syntax, that is syntax analysis. And then we're going to go into data types and expressions today. Um, let me check because I rebooted. Do I have, um, no, let me start. The scribbling software. Yes, okay. So uh, we're going to go into data type, type and expressions. Um, I decided to reduce syntax analysis. My original plan was to um, actually talk about uh, the types of grammars that can be uh, analyzed efficiently. But uh, looking at it, it doesn't seem that I would be able to compress it in half a lecture. So I'm going to show you a bit of syntax analysis by example. and. Uh, uh, with the highlight of that being building an AST. And then we're going to go into data types, which was supposed to be originally uh, what this lecture was supposed to be uh, devoted to. Um, and data types means that are, uh, exist with the purpose of building expressions out of um, building blocks out of data, right? So we're going to look at expressions, and we're going to take uh, Python as a case study today. Um, so let's. Uh, Remember a bit uh, what we talked about last time. So the important concept was unambiguous grammar. And uh, the gr grammars was, were good to check for syntactic correctness. That's what we uh, wanted them for, to s be able to say this program is correct and this attempt to write a program is incorrect. And for correct programs, we would like to be able to produce abstract syntax trees which were very simplified uh, views of our, uh, um, you know, phrase, sentence, uh, or program, if you will, right? Because uh, generally we want to apply syntactic analysis to programs especially. So a very compressed uh, view of the program that still has the syntactic structure. So we have information about uh, the nesting of the blocks, the uh, uh, precedence of operators and associativity as well. Uh, later, we'll see, we'll introduce scopes, so we want to have information about the scoping of variables in this IST uh, and so on. Linear complexity is desired, however, uh, we won't be looking at linear uh, syntactic analysis uh, today because it's just too complicated, we won't fit into uh, half a lecture. So uh, there are, you should know that there are algorithms out, out there, and it's actually a, a topic that I'm, I happen to be very familiar with, so I can talk, if you get me started, I can talk for half a semester only about um, these type of grammars, LL and LR, um, right? LL uh, grammars uh, are, are um, uh, linear, uh, but cannot handle left recursion, right? So no left recursion, which is necessary to model left associativity, right? And left uh, LR grammars and their uh, variant LALR are the more general ones. So they're really complicated, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of concepts to introduce in order to understand how they work. Uh, nevertheless, they're pretty efficient and pretty expressive. Uh, what do we look in these grammars, just you know, for your information? So they're still context-free grammars as the ones that you've learned about, and the, the rules in the grammar must have certain properties to qualify as LL and LR. We can generate from a grammar directly the syntax analyzer automatically. For LL grammars, there is one such parser generator. Anybody knows uh, the name? Parser generator that works with LL grammars. Prolog? Louder. Prolog? Prolog, no. Prolog is not a parser generator. So there's this thing called Antler. All right? And for LALR, there's one that is very old and very famous and very 
What's the best known parser generator? Nobody. No Linux gigs. Flex is scanner generator. What's the other one? Flex and? <coughs> Yuck, right? Which stands for yet another compiler compiler. Because at the time, there were many, so many generators, which were called compiler compilers, right? A compiler that generates a compiler. So they made one that was yet another one, and it's, it, it, it was the best. So this is the one that, this is maybe 40 years old. So the development started about 40 years ago. And there's a newer and more efficient version called Bison, right, which you will find in uh, most versions of Linux now. It works in tandem with a scanner generator called Lex, or the recent version, the new uh, uh, upgraded version is Flex. Uh, but they're essentially not very different from the original ones which are uh, de uh, designed 40 years ago. So uh, if you want to know more, there's the compiler design course 4212 which I also happen to teach. That's the place where these things are covered in more detail. So let's uh, proceed with um, learning how to write a syntax analyzer, not the most efficient kind, but uh, parsers are, uh, I mean, small parsers are, um, you know, essentially uh, staffable. You need to write, to, to do a little parsing every once in a while, so you need to know how to do that. We're going to introduce yet another new concept, which is going to be important later. So this is part of a gradual uh, introduction of concepts, reasoning rules. And we're going to revisit this concept when we talk about semantics, which is going to be next time. Um, so they have this format. It's a mathematical concept. We put a bar. Above the bar, we put the premises. Below the bar, we put the conclusion. OK? So. And uh, each premise is essentially a judgment performed in a certain context. So we say that if in the context one, we can make judgment one, and in context two, we can make judgment two, and so on and so forth, and in context n, we can make judgment n, then it must be the case. So we, we talked about all the premises. So it must be the case, then it must be the case that in context, we can make judgment. All right? And why do we do this? Well, because it resembles very much a prologue rule. Actually, prologue was devised to model reasoning rules. This is going to be later the head. And this is going to be the body. And we have some side conditions that explain usually some of the notation that we use in the judgments. right? And that side condition will have to be modeled somehow in the body of the rule as well. OK, so this is the meaning of the rule. And uh, that's what the side condition is for. And uh, we, can, we can take the grammar that we have seen and model the syntactic analysis process as a bunch of reasoning rules. Right? So here, in the lower left corner, there's the grammar as a reminder is the grammar that we used last time for expressions. And it's a grammar that has, that models correctly the associativity and precedence of plus, minus, star, division, and um, uh, power operator, right? So remember that in order to have uh, a left associativity, we need to have left recursion. And you can see the left recursion here. Sub-expression goes to sub-expression term plus minus. Without this, we can't have left associativity. We also have left associativity. Maybe I should change color, right? We also have left associativity uh, implemented by subterm, sub by the non-terminal subterm for multiplication and division. Nevertheless, for for um, uh, uh, power operator, 
we have right recursion because we need right associativity, right? So remember that whenever we write 1 plus 2 plus 3, the first operation is supposed to be the left plus, right? If I say 2 to the power 3 to the power 4, which is the first operator to be performed? The right one, right? So this associativity is implemented in the grammar as either left recursion or right recursion. Remember that. And there was, there was this big tree. Actually, I might be able to revive, to bring back that tree. Let's go back to last time's lecture. Oh, no. Two, two, two lectures ago. Lecture three. So let me bring back that three. This one. All right. So this one was the parse tree for an expression, right, in, in that grammar, right? And this is where we have seen how left associativity and right associativity work, um, right? The, the, uh, the frontier is the uh, important concept here. It's one what recognizes the, um, um, the uh, string. And one important aspect is, right, so, and this is the AST, right? which we're going to build. Um, so all, all these concepts were, were explained there. Let me go back to syntactic analysis. Uh, all right. And we're going to now model all the grammar rules as um, um, reasoning rules in order to facilitate uh, uh, syntactic analysis. So we're going to say the following, right? If sub-expression, the sub-expression terminal generates this, this, this string S1 and the term non-terminal generates the string S2, then the expression non-terminal should generate, must be able to generate the string S, where S is S1 concatenated with S2, right? And this is, in fact, an instance of the first production rule, right? Because expression, right, is rewritten as sub-expression and term. So if this guy, sub-expression, generates a string and term generates another string, by concatenating these two strings, we get something from the language of expression. <coughs> so we have it here, right? And every reasoning, uh, every pr uh, production rule will have a corresponding reasoning rule. Same here. Sub-expression generates S1. If sub-expression generates S1, and if term generates S2, then sub-expression must be able to generate S, where S is S1, S2, S3, concatenation of these three strings, where S3 is either plus or minus. Right? And you see that here we have sub-expression, a string coming from sub-expression, another string coming from term, and either the symbol plus or the symbol minus. Right? So these are reasoning rules that model the process of syntax analysis. And we have one reasoning rule for every production of the gram. Is this clear? Uh, we have changed the identifier to, uh, identifiers from last time to be the entire set of small letters. So we assume that identifiers are just one letter for simplicity. What we're interesting here, interested here in is to see that associativity and precedence are modeled correctly. So the fact that uh, the identifiers are simplified doesn't really hamper us too much. Is this clear? OK, so now the explanation, of course, if you get to read these offline, then the added comments would help you a bit more, right? Every production has a reasoning rule. And from the reasoning rules, we write prolog code. As I was saying, 
each reasoning rule will have a prolog rule, corresponding prolog rule, right? The reading is very straightforward. We're saying expression generates S in the ring reasoning rule. Here we're saying the predicate expert for expression accepts S. So it's supposed to succeed if, if S is part of the language and fail otherwise. So we're going to say the following, that if S1 is accepted by sub-expression and S2 is accepted by term, then by appending S1 and S2, I get a string S, which should be accepted by expression. All right? And now you're going to wonder, why do we use append? Well, we use append because what looks like strings and prolog is in fact syntactic sugar for a list of ASCII codes. All right, and I will show you what I mean by that. All right, so if I say X, is bound to the string ABC, what you would perceive as a string, right? What comes back is what where ABC was, now what we have is a list of ASCII codes, right? So eventually we're going to write something like X per of, uh, let's say, A plus B, right? I haven't loaded the program, so this will fail, but I can I can do that as well, so the program is there. But what A plus B is translated into is the ASCII, the list containing the ASCII code of A, the ASCII code of plus, the ASCII code of B. That's how Prolog works. So this is why our strings here are lists and manipulated with the predicate append, which can append lists. The second rule says sub-expression accepts the empty string, which is also the empty list, right? Then we keep going, right? So sub-expression S accepts the string S, right? If sub-expression accepts S1, term accepts S2, there's some O that is either plus or minus, and then S1 appended with S2, appended with O, returns S. And here again, we introduce a new element, which is a new kind of use for append. Append, you might remember it as accepting two strings, sorry, two lists, and returning the concatenation of that. But another possible use, so you remember it probably uh, in this format, one comma two, 3, 4, and x, and we get the concatenation, right? But we can have it accept only two arguments in the following form, right? 1, 2, and 3, 4, we put it in a list, and now we have only two arguments. But the first one is a list of lists, and we get a concatenation of that. And the advantage is that inside the first list, we can have many more lists. So we can perform concatenations of multiple lists, not limited to two. I can put a five, six here, and I will get one, two, three, four, five, six. So the append, the form of append with only two arguments is a lot more flexible and is the one that we're using today. You see it being used right here, right? S so we have two arguments. The first argument is a list containing three lists, and all of them concatenated should produce S. All right? And we keep going like that for every prolog rule. For every reasoning rule, we have a prolog rule, OK? So notice the fact that we're using lists of lists everywhere, right? Notice that for the first prolog rule, Right, the first problem is an implementation of the first reasoning rule, right? We have yet another one for the third reasoning rule, or for the second reasoning rule, I, rule, I think. We get uh, the third prolog rule, and um, the, second, the third reasoning rule gives us the second prolog rule, and so on and so forth, right? So we, uh, this is the model that we apply. And Everything seems logically correct, right? 
And it seems that if we run this program, we should be able to accept strings. But it's not quite true. And the reason for that is the left recursion that we have, combined with the fact that the left recursive non-terminals generate the empty string. And it so happens that the empty string is a prefix of the empty string, and that's a recipe for infinite loop. All right? And uh, in general, how, how does this work procedurally? Well, you see, w this will be a bound list. This will be something like A plus B. Right? And then this append predicate, S comes in here, and we'll have to make successive guesses about how to split this expression so that the left part of it goes into S1 here, the right part of it goes into S2. The first guess of a pen will be that S1 should be the empty list, right? Because that's how it works. Remember what happens if I say x, y, and 1, 2, 3. What am I going get, to get for x and y? Empty 1, 2, 3 first. Then 1 and 2, 3. Very good. Then 1, 2, and 3. Then 1, 2, 3, and empty. And finally, no solution is found. So the first guess that a pen takes is to make this the empty list. Okay? And then the empty lists can be further split into the empty list and the empty list. So that's the problem with that piece of code. All right? So the first guess that is taken here is S1 being the empty list. We go into sub-expression here. All right? So this succeeds. It's fine. And then we're going to go into term that goes subterm generates the empty list as well. So at some point, we're going to recurse over, and the empty list will be its own prefix, and we go into infinite loop. All right? So this is a general problem with left recursion. Left recursive grammars are have this, have this problem. All right? And uh, the only way to take care of that is to go into a different kind of parsing, which is called uh, bottom-up parsing, which is what the LR grammars are for. But we can overcome this problem at, exp at the expense of losing linearity. We're going to go into a um, n-square kind of um, syntax analysis and employ some heuristics. All right, and let's see what the heuristics would be. So first of all, if we look carefully at term, right, the, the term grammar generates only either a number or a number times another number or a number power another number. It cannot contain the operator plus, at least not outside brackets. So this term, first of all, must be non-empty. Right? First of all, it must be non-empty, because an expression is in general non-empty. It must be at least an operator. Or it can be operator, operand, operator, where it can be oper operator, operand brackets, and so on, right? But it cannot be empty. And because this cannot be empty, right, this will provide more guidance to this append for splitting the string S. So the second one is that there should be no plus or minus outside bracket. So if this S2 is something like uh, A star B plus C, you see this plus inside brackets is fine. But outside of the brackets, the language of terms should not have plus or minus. Is this clear? And obviously, the brackets that we have inside should be balanced. The number of open brackets should be equal to the number of closed brackets. And as we scan the string from left to right, the number of open brackets that we have encountered must always be larger than the number of 
closed bracket that we have in count. Right? So looking at the grammar, we can, we notice this simple fact that we want to implement now as heuristics. Okay? So we're going to write another predicate that we're going to add to the body of every rule to constrain right the argument of term and a similar kind of a similar kind of uh, uh, constraint can be imposed for factor so factor will be how right again must be non empty must have balanced brackets and what should not appear outside brackets what kind of operators should not appear in factor Louder. Division. Division and multiplication, right? So this will have no plus, oh, sorry, no star or division. And the same should be for base, right? Base, again, should be not empty. Should, must, must have balanced brackets. And what operator should not appear inside the base? No. Exponentiation, right? All the exponentiation is outside of the base, right? So a factor is S1 to the power of S2. So inside of S1, and because I have right associativity, inside S1 I should not have any, I should not have any uh, um, exponentiation, any power operator. Okay? So what do we do? We, this again states all the constraints. So we add these constraints. So this is again the same program where every body of a rule has been augmented by this predicate, which imposes the constraints on a specific substring, right? So here the substring of interest is S2. So S2 must not be empty. Right? We're also saying that this S should be the concatenation of S1 and S2. And we're also saying that S2 should not contain any of these operators. And S2, of course, would have balanced brackets. Right? So we managed to factorize the constraint. And we're constraining these um, terms. Right? So the same here. S2 is the term of interest. S2 should not be empty. All right? And S2, so, so there's a new element here. S2 should be the S, sorry, this S should be the concatenation of these three, where O is an operator that should be a member of this. And S2 at the same time should not contain any of the operators in here. Okay, here the substring of interest is S2. S2 should not be empty. This S should be S1 concatenated with S2. And S2 should not contain any of these operators. Okay, here this guy is the substring of interest. S2 should not be empty, right? S should be S1, S2, and O concatenated together. This, so, so here, what I didn't say is that this should be plus or minus, right? So it is one of these guys. Because sub-expression is what? Is a sub-expression, a term, and the plus or minus put together, right? This is the production rule. So it's the same here. S should be S1, S2, and O, where O is either star or division, right? Uh, but then, what do, we, what do we know? We know that S2 should be non-empty, and we also know that S2 should not contain any of these operators. So what we did was we took the previous program, and we augmented it with a little predicate everywhere, in every body of, the, of every rule, imposing a certain constraint. So if you want, this is an instance of aspect-oriented programming. It was brought up at some point, right? So we have a model, right? We want to program by following a model. We go from grammar to reasoning rules 
to prolog rules, and then we augment those prolog rules by a certain aspect to make it work for us. Right? And this is an important aspect of programming languages. This is one important aspect of software engineering. If you make this process of creating a software product as a stream of phases, as a succession of phases, right? Each phase being very well defined, your chance of writing correct software is much more improved, right? So we don't want to completely throw away what we've seen before. We want to augment it, and we want to augment it in, a such, a, in such a way that on one hand, it, it, it preserves as much of the structure as we had before because our understanding is like that, right? And also we bring in a certain new aspect. All right, we, we bring it at all the, uh, all the points in the program. So you see every rule that doesn't generate empty gets this constraint predicate. Let's look at this one because this one is, is different from the previous ones, right? So here, the predicate of interest is, the substring of interest is S1. S1 should not be empty. This S should be S1 concatenated with S2. Right? And S1 should not contain the power operator. Okay? So this is what this constraint predicate is doing here. So we're saying that this argument should be non-empty. Non Notice how we say that. S1 should be a list with some head and some tail. That's sufficient to say that S1 is non-empty. We're saying that all the elements in L concatenated together should produce S, which is what we have seen here. We're saying that S1 should have balanced predicates. And in the process of checking for balanced predicates, we extract the symbols that are outside brackets. R1 will be S1 with all the brackets removed. So for instance, if if my R1 is A plus B plus C plus D, R1 is going to be A plus plus D. Okay? Why? Because we have this restriction that some operators should not appear in outside brackets in S1, right? And this is how we say that. We say that the, that there should be no occurrence of any of the O operators, any of the OL operators, none of these should appear in R1, right? Which is saying, which is the same as saying none of those operators should appear in S1 but outside brackets. Okay? And also, we're going to say that O this O, which appeared here, right, should be a member of these two, one of these two operators, right? So this is how we say it here. If O is not empty, you see sometimes it is empty. You see it here being empty. If O is not empty, then we want O to be a member of the OL. And at this point, we introduce something that you, I'm not, I can't, I can't remember you've seen it in, in Prolog. It's the if statement in Prolog, right? If this succeeds, then we continue by executing this side. And if this fails, if this part fails, then we continue with this side. And true is the unit predicate that vacuously succeeds. All right, so you're going to have to take a closer look at this uh, code. The code is provided for you, and you can run it and understand how it works, right? What we want to learn from here is this succession of transformations that we have performed on a piece of code to bring it to do what we want while preserving the structure of the original model, which was the grammar, right? The structure of the grammar is still visible in this code. And this is good software engineering. Is this clear? <clears throat> Also notice that you know you, we're writing we're writing uh, uh, we're writing a, a syntax analyzer in a page and a half of code, right? And uh, try doing it in C. <laughs>
try doing it, doing it in C and uh, compare how much more or less code you'd be writing. All right. So this is what works. All right. And these are the constraints that are imposed. Right, so you'll see all the constraints and exactly where they go. All right, uh, let me show you a demo and find all. So you would understand how it works. So the find all predicate. So we have append x, y, right? And let's put append x, y in, in a find all. We're going to write find all. And I'm going to take pairs of x and y. And uh, I'm going to run this predicate. And I want the results in a list L. All right. And look at what happened. Uh, let me make it even more obvious. Let me put a, a solution here. So look at what happened. Previously, when we would run a, a, the append predicate with two variables on the first two arguments, we get six different solutions. We have to keep pressing semicolon, right? To get all the solutions. Now, we didn't get the semicolon thing anymore. We have gotten all the solutions placed in a list. Okay? So that's what happens. Um, all right, so you see these two. X, Y represent the first solution to append. And you find it here. The next solution, 1 and 2, 3, right, the one that you see here, you find it here. This is the third solution. And there's a fourth solution as well, right? So find all helps us aggregate solutions into one single query. All right? Now, the important thing for us in the constraint predicate is to say that something has no solution. How are we going to say that? So for instance, If I put a 4 here, this has no solution, right? So how do I check whether a predicate has no solution? Yet, 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 not fail. Well, so if I'm going to say 4 here, now I don't have a Y anymore. And L is going to be what, do you think? What is L going to be? Louder. Empty list. Very good. Right? So you see, my query didn't fail. My query didn't fail. But I check, is a way to check whether this query has no solutions. I get the empty list in return, and I, my original assumption is correct. I know that. So it's the same. What we do here is the same. Right, when you see this find all, so we're trying to check whether OL and R1 have no members in common. This means that no occurrence of the operators in OL appear in R1. And we check that by putting the result of find all, by imposing the result of um, find all to be the empty list. All right, so we're saying R1, remember, is the, the operator that are outside brackets in S1. So we're saying no plus or minus in the term, but outside brackets. So this is how we say it. No element of OL should also be a member of R1. OL is plus or minus. R1 is, is symbols outside brackets. And if they don't have elements in common, the results should be at the empty list. All right, so uh, these heuristics will be applied in all the places, and this is a good 
approach because it preserves the structure of the grammar. We do a very systematic thing. We like to do systematic things. We put this constraint in every body of every rule. Okay? And now the program works. So we can have a query like this. And, well, it's a bit... Um, it's a bit uh, like, uh, you know, no, nothing, nothing big happens. It just succeeds. Right? Previously, on the previous program, it will go into infinite loop, but now it just succeeds, and of course it fails for a wrong expression. Right? So if we have this kind of thing, you're going to get that S is, as a, uh, an answer, you're going to get that S is the list of all the ASCII characters, and it just says true, which is a bit... Um, uh, you know, not 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 very uh, not a very big thing. Uh, so, what can we do from here? Well, what we really want is to have a uh, abstract syntax tree. So, remember this picture that I drew, and what you see in the big picture is the parse tree, the derivation tree. And what you see in the little picture in the left lower corner is the AST, which has the structure of the expression, right? It preserves the associativity and uh, um, precedence of uh, all the operators, but it's much simpler to work with, right? So we'd like to be able to produce exactly that from our parser. And where where do we see these, this tree? Where is it important? What models? What, what is this tree put in correspondence with? Looking at our prolog program. Is the tree of louder? Sorry, evaluation is the tree of calls, right? The predicate expression will call. So the predicate expression will call sub-expression and later term. When sub-expression is called, it will call sub-expression and term again, and check that minus is appended, right? When this sub-expression is called, it will call sub-expression and term. When this sub-expression is called, will match the argument, the matching argument of sub-expression is going to be the empty string, right? On this side, this term will call sub-expression again, which will match the empty string, and will call factor. So this is the tree of calls. If you imagine how the prolog program is executed, right, this is what you're going to see, Right? If you take this, this program and execute it in the meta.pl that you have seen last time, you will see exactly this tree. Of course, that tree will expand horizontally, will not expand in depth because this is how we do the drawing. But you're going to see that expression called sub expression and then later term and, and so on. All right? So that's the correspondence. What we need in, to work with is something much simpler. So let's see how we can do that. So one important concept here, remember that, that uh, we draw this red arrow saying that, well, the, some operators need to be hoisted. They need to be hoisted. They need to go, for instance, this minus, right, cannot be attached to its parent. It has to go two levels up. And uh, in order to be able to do that, right, because one of, uh, how, how are we going to produce the tree? We're going to get to put a new argument to each of these predicates, right, which is the output, the, the, the syntax tree output, the AST output, right? But these residual operators cannot be part of that tree. The tree corresponding to this sub-expression cannot have this inside. So we're going to have this residual operator as a separate argument. And we're going to have it only for those non-terminals that do have 
the residual operators, you see? So sub-expression sub -expression has residual operators. Let's identify more, right? This minus goes here, so it's also sub-expression. Then subterm has residual operators. Then um, what else? The rest expression has residual operators, right? And these are all actually the only ones. So if you look carefully at this image, you'll see that only the left recursive non-terminals have residual operators. So these predicates, the predicates corresponding to these non-terminals, are going to get extra arguments. Okay? So, again, we do a systematic transformation. We take the previous program, which was working, and we augment it a little bit to do the work for us. Right? So we're going to take, to add, just one new thing. Well, actually, sometimes it's two things, because there's this thing here as well. We're going to talk about that in a second. But essentially, we add this build. All right? Notice that we have a new argument here, which is the, the AST that is to be returned. Right? And sub-expression will have a residual operator here. We'll have the tree and the residual operator. Right subterm will have the tree and the residual operator. Term does not have a residual operator, so just returns a tree, and so on. Okay. Um, now, what what is the AST? So if I have uh, a plus b star c, right? The AST should be plus a star. B, C. But when we're going to print this on the screen, what is prolog going to print? Well, plus and star are operators. So it's going to print A plus B star C with no quotes. So the lack of quotes is what how we are going to know that this is in fact a tree and not a string. Alright? Now Remember that this is a list, and this is, in fact, the number 97, and this is 98, and so on. But I can't have the number 97 here. What I need is to get back the symbol A, the atom A, right? So this predicate is going to do this for us. Char code, op and O, is going to convert the number O into the atom corresponding to that number. So the ASCII code 97, passed in as an argument to O, will put back into op the, 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 the atom A. All right? So it's a simple conversion predicate, but it's what we need to build up the tree. We can't build up the tree out of the number 97. We need the atom A back. Is this clear? Um, yeah, actually, this will work for plus. I don't know what the ASCII code for plus is. So this will be plus or... All right, so, so how do we build a tree? Well, we have to see whether we have a residual operator or not, right? So this build procedure, right, will do the following, right? We are calling recursively. Let's take this one. We are calling recursively sub-expression. And this will return a tree and a potential residual operator. And we are calling term, and this will return a tree. Okay? So, um, uh, if, if, um, so, so we have to check whether, what kind of, of, of operator this is. If this is a residual operator, it will always be the case that T1 is a valid tree, right? So whenever we have a valid tree, we also have a valid residual operator. If we don't have a valid residual operator, then we don't have a tree either. So this build checks, checks the value of T1, as a matter of fact, sees if it is nil or not, and if it is nil, it will just return T2 as the tree. It just passes on the current tree. Why? Because the current 
the current sub-expression, the, the sub-expression just generated the empty string. But if the T1 is a valid tree, then O1 must also be a valid <laughs> residual operator passed from sub-expression. And then we do the hoisting of two levels, right? So my current tree must be O1, T1, T2. So this will be built here. All right, so this is what build does. Does a relatively simple operation. Checks whether the residual operator is valid or not. If it is valid, it builds a tree with it. If it isn't, it just passes on the other, the other valid tree. All right? So now we build the tree, right? We piggyback on the syntax analyzer and uh, all the T's are ASTs. Notice the following, right? There's a residual operator. If sub-expression generates the empty string, then the residual operator is nil and the tree is nil. There's no tree, right? If sub-expression, uh, let me go and, and expose the code uh, completely, um, all right? So uh, notice also the following, that this O, that appears at a current level will necessarily be residual. We know in advance when an operator is residual. So let me go back here, right? When this sub-expression detects this minus, this minus will necessarily be a residual. I don't even th have to think about it. What's the tree for this level? The tree for this level is made up only of this operator. Let's take uh, maybe different example ah, I don't have a good example all right this one right so this so rest expression, when it detects this power operator, it will know that this necessarily is residual. What do we have? So you see this, uh, this operator, right, comes at this level. What is the root? What, what do we replace this with? We replace it with this power operator from here, right, which is also hoisted as well. Um, all right, so whenever we have the grammar rule, let me go to grammar rule and explain this. Let's show you what will be residual necessarily right here. Right? So this guy will be this guy will be residual. This guy will be residual. And this guy will be residual. For the current level, when we call rest expression and this rest expression detects this power, it's residual, right? Because I already have a subtree coming from base and I already have a subtree and a residual operator coming from rest expression. So here I would have a T1, here I would have a T2 and an O, right? T1, T2 and O will already make my tree. This guy, I don't know what to do with it right now. The only thing I can do is pass it up to the next level. All right. Well, you look at the code and surely understand how it works. All right, so this is a query. We take an expression, which can be as complicated as we like, and we call the start non-terminal and we expect t to become the tree. And as you can see, the t, t does become the tree. It's the same expression, but when it's printed out, it's printed out without uh, double quotes. Therefore, it's, an, it's a term. It's no longer a list of ASCII codes. And it is indeed the abstract syntax tree of um, the original expression. All right?
Okay. Look at it. Most of you are already half asleep. Come on, wake up. Does everybody understand the distinction between the string and the tree? At least take that from here. So S is a string, T is a tree. Louder? L is showing you that T is a tree. So I'm saying that, uh, so this is the univ operator, right? That will convert the term into the list containing its functor and its argument. All right, so the uh, lowest precedence operator here is star, which should be the root of the uh, abstract syntax tree. And indeed you see it, that this is the root this is the left argument of, of the root up to here, and this is the right argument of the root, right? So L is provided there as a demonstration that I can, that, that T is in, in, indeed a, a tree. It has a root and a left side and a right side, and I can further de decompose the left side and the right side into their components, right? And, and it's there just to increase your confidence that he is a tree rather than a sequence of symbols. Come on, wake up. So this is all about abstract, um, abstract syntax trees and, and uh, syn syntactic analysis. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to get to practice the concept in the homework. So you'll be sure to <laughs> understand this code uh, um, a lot better. And we move on, we move on to uh, data structures, right? Uh, so remember, what I want you to take from this lecture, because I understand that, you know, the program is, uh, is, uh, is put there as, you know, an illustration, but the important aspect that we have experienced is the systematic development of one piece of software into the next, right, by maintaining the same structure. This is... Um, this is good software engineering. This is what uh, languages should allow, right? You should, and, and this is, it's not just languages, right? Languages should foster this kind of development, but your thinking, your, uh, your, uh, when you're thinking about code architecture, you should um, try to apply this principle. Data types. <clears throat> so data types are means of providing interpretation to the bits. Remember that inside the hardware, all we have is bits. Whether a set of bits represents an integer or a floating point number or something else, that's only in our mind. All right? And we have certain operations which will be correct depending on our interpretation of those bits. Obviously, we have two types. We have basic data types, which are the ones supported in hardware, and we have means of aggregating those, right? So those supported in hardware, it's normal why we want to have it, right? If integers are implemented in hardware, I want to have them in my language because every operation on integers is going to be using machine instructions that are very fast, so I can implement those very um, easily. But there are a lot of other data uh, types that we want to uh, support. One thing that I haven't said here, right? So, there, there, for, for instance, 
Um, I'm not quite sure where to uh, where to categorize this. There, there's uh, such thing as uh, infinite precision numbers, right? Numbers. So they are not basic. They're not quite aggregate data types, all right? Um, and they're available, and they're very useful in general. Um, why do we want aggregate data types? For the same reason why when you go on a trip, you use a piece of luggage, or piece, you use a, a suitcase, right? You, put, you don't take all your you know, belongings, whatever you want to take with you, you don't put them in your arms and go to the airport, right? You put them in a suitcase, and you take the suitcase to the airport, right? So this is why we put uh, several pieces of data inside a structure in C, and then allow the programs to use that structure, right? The structure is a suitcase that uh, contains a lot of details, but in many uh, situations, you want to just look at that as a standalone entity without really uh, invest looking at the look at, at, at the details inside. Now, data types in strongly typed languages, which we're going to experience soon are also means of specifying a certain kind of correctness, and we'll see what that means. C is in general very permissive in, what, in how we can convert a data type into another, right? Uh, a lot of languages are not, and they, the, the rationale for that uh, is that um, data type conversions are the source of many bugs, right? So by trying to convert uh, uh, data between two types, you may make mistakes, those languages don't allow it, and, 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 and consider that as means of enforcing a certain kind of correctness on the programs. Uh, so we're going to see a bit of OCaml and Haskell, and we're going to see how this uh, uh, is realized. Um, this is a list of basic types. We, you've seen it before, right? It's important, they're important because all operations are fast. Right, so we want to be able to master these operations, but I'm not going to uh, uh, go through them again. Um, we have data type conversions, right? And, and uh, the interesting case study here is C. Uh, these data type conversions are called costs. And how do we perform these data type conversions? Well, there's two approaches. One is a notion of value can be preserved. Right? So you take the value of the right-hand side and you assign to the left-hand side of the assignment in such a way that that value is somehow preserved. Right? So if I take a char and assign, and, and, uh, assign that to an int, I can sign extend and the value is preserved. Right? If I take an integer and assign it to a float or a uh, double precision number, the value is preserved. The bits are not preserved. It's not the same bits. And in some cases, the number of bits is different, right? But the value is preserved. We have a notion of value that we can preserve. When we take a, a double precision number and assign it to an integer, also some notion of value is preserved. We take the integer part of that double number, right, integral part, and move it into the integer. So we sort of have a notion of value being preserved. But there are many cases when this is not possible. If I'm going to assign a negative char to an unsigned long, there's no way I can preserve the value, right? Negative values are not uh, available for unsigned numbers. Therefore, if the two data types have the same length, the same size, the bits would be copied over, right? So that's what happens. The bits would be copied over. I take an int and I assign it to the unsigned int. If the int has a negative value, that cannot be preserved, right? So what we do is just copy the bits over. Uh, if we have pointers, if we go from a pointer to integer uh, into a pointer to char, right? There's no notion of value really there. The bits are copied over. So there are these two cases, and in general, yeah, at least in C, the type of conversion that is employed is a bit ad hoc. So you have to know all the cases, um, right? 
So you, you have, but it, it's relatively easy to come up with pieces of code that will exhibit the type of conversion that is performed, right? And this is the best time, the best way to learn. Uh, now, when we have operations on different data types, right? Uh, how are the, there will be implicit conversions taking place, all right? And how are these conversions performed, right? So let's say we have this kind of thing, int a float b, x is assigned a plus b. So plus is either between two integers or between two floats, right? Well, we have a type hierarchy. So uh, where integer is on lower level than float. And we always try to convert the lower type in the hierarchy to the higher type, right? So uh, uh, the compiler will say, well, I can convert the integer to a float, and then I have an addition between two floats, and that's legal. So an implicit conversion of int to float will be performed uh, there, right? And uh, similarly, if we have a char and an int, right, we don't know how to add to a char and an int, but we know how to add either to chars or to integers, right? So the compiler will come and say the char is lower on the hierarchy. Sorry, yeah, char, char is lower on the hierarchy or on the type hierarchy than int. So char can be converted into int, and the compiler will figure that out and convert the a to an int and then perform the addition. The conversion between char and int is going to be by sign extension, right? And it's it's relatively easy to, to do that, right? If you have two 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 types of two uh, variables of different types, you just say a equals b, right? You go into the debugger, and uh, you you see the hexadecimal content of these two, and you'll see very quickly what kind of conversion is performed, right? Because there aren't that many. Either you copy the bits, or you sign and extend the bits, or there's a conversion from integral to float where the bits completely change, and you can you can sense that very quickly. Conversions are ad hoc. So normally you should draw a big table saying where each type can be converted into each other type. But there is a general rule. And also there will be a conversion when we call a procedure, right? We call f, right? F is declared to be of type end, but we put an argument of type float, float will be converted into end, right? Taking only the integral part, right? To meet the, um, to, to meet the um, uh, requirements. And uh, in, in many compilers nowadays, this will generate a warning. In previous compilers, uh, previous versions of compilers, this wasn't uh, the case. Uh, so there's a, there's a small issue. Languages like OCaml, for instance, do not allow, do not have any implicit costs. They will have explicit functions that you can apply to any object to obtain an object of any other type. So there's a function that converts from integers to floats. And you can't put an integer where a float is, ex is expected. You have to convert explicitly, right? And some programmers will say it's a matter of taste here, right? Some programmers will be uh, completely annoyed by this approach. Some other programmers will be happy to be constantly reminded of their type, of the type of their uh, variables, um, right? Because when you work on a big piece of code, uh, you started to work on it two, two weeks ago, right? And now you're thinking, oh, yeah, I have to operate on that X, but I can't remember the type of X. Is it unsigned int or is it int? Or... And um, the temptation is very often to take a shortcut. Instead of going to look what it is declared as, you take a shortcut. Let me write, let me press compile, and if I don't get any warnings, fine. <laughs> right? Have you done that? Yeah, all right, I've done it. I've, I'm doing it all the time, um, all right? So then I might discover the bug much later. But in a language like, like OCaml, this is not possible, right? This will not be just a, uh, just a, um, a, a warning. It, that would be a compiler error, right? So then I do have to go and check the type of my data and uh, employ the correct conversion explicitly. Um, 
Okay. So this is a matter of choice. If you are the language designer, how do you uh, do data type conversions? Um, scripting languages are much worse. There's a lot more implicit conversions going on there, and there's a lot more overloading, right? You can say here that plus is overloaded, right? Because it can operate between any two numeric types. But uh, if you go to Java, it also operates between strings. And if you go to Python, it uh, also operates between lists, right? Concatenates lists. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and it might automatically convert. If you have a list plus a number, it might automatically convert the number into a list, right? Which is not necessarily what you might be intending. Uh, so it's a matter of taste. Some people like it, uh, some people uh, don't. Usually if you write large software, um, you would prefer to be reminded of the type of your data all the time. All right, aggregate types. So we have many ways of aggregating data. The easiest, the most straightforward is arrays. Most languages provide records, right? See, they're called structures. Um, their extension in object-oriented programming uh, gives rise to objects. Uh, also in C we have a very interesting kind of aggregation. It's not really aggregation. It's uh, you know overlapping, if you want, for saving space, which is unions, right? You put in an union several fields. All those fields share the space, which means that if you assign to a field, all the other fields are clobbered. And we have a number of high-level aggregate data types, right? which in general are available in libraries to most languages, but some languages make the conscious choice of providing, of making these data types first class citizens. They are part of language. They come at the level of the language rather than uh, the library, and that makes the syntax a bit more palatable, right? But, but has the disadvantage that, uh, uh, you know, you can't change the library to get a better version of your uh, high-level data types, you have to wait for the entire language to change, right? And we're going to see these in uh, Python uh, shortly. So uh, this is a reminder of what a structure looks like, right? In C, the important aspect is that each field will be seen as an offset from the base of the, um, from the, base of the structure, and uh, the structure represents just the means of accessing packed data. Um, with uh, no other goodies. There's uh, always the possibility of converting a structure into any other structure if you want, right, through a cost. Uh, uh, so the only advantage here is the automatic computation of the offsets of the fields. Uh, a union has the same syntax, similar syntax, just that all these fields share the space. So if you assign to field 1, the value of field 2, field 3, and field 4 will change. If you assign field 2, the value of field 1, field 3, and field 4 will change as well, right? So it's just a little gimmick to allow the programmer to save space, which is generally useful in embedded systems and in operating systems, not so useful in application programming, right? Nowadays, memory is very cheap, so you don't are not that bothered to uh, share the space of an integer and uh, an array of characters, for instance, um, um, because you're not you don't happen to use them both at the same time. All right, uh, C pointers are another way of sort of implicitly aggregating data because you get a pointer. And the assumption is that it points to either a structure or an array of things. Um, so remember, the memory is an array of bytes, and the pointer is sort of an unsigned integer. Um, and uh, the question is, you know, why, if, if pointers are unsigned integers, why bother to distinguish them from unsigned integers? Well, because the system can look at the, the correspondence of types, right, at the propagation of types, and can give you a little bit more warnings about the way you're using pointers uh, detecting potential bugs, right? If um, that didn't happen, then you would have practically no idea when 
you might have no idea when you're operating on a, an unallocated pointer uh, or when, when, when you're performing potentially dangerous conversions and, and so on. Um, we have C is the only language that has uh, that has pointer arithmetic, right? So so some uh, languages have C plus plus oh C plus plus as well, right? Uh, would have uh, a notion of pointers, but not necessarily allow to add a quantity, not allow the assignment of an of a random integer to a pointer, right? So in C you can do something like P. It's assigned one, two, three, four. Well, maybe you were going to say void star one, two, three, four, and that's the that's something that is never, almost never, almost almost never useful, right? Unless you are in an embedded system and you know for sure that address one, two, three, four has some um, some special kind of information there. Uh, it's it's almost never useful. Um, it's it's the only place where you can do that. Uh, the address of any L value can be captured into a pointer. So you know what an L value is. What's an L value in C? Whatever we can put on the left hand side of an assignment. Right? So the address of that can always be captured into a pointer. We can have pointers to function. Functions, right? So if I have a function returning some type, Later in my code, I can perform this declaration, type star p. How do I read this? p is a pointer to a function that returns type. We start, we go inside out. We start from the identifier and we start reading towards the outside. The star and the brackets are just type operators. They have their own precedence. So, if I write star p and brackets, this has higher precedence than this. The brackets have higher precedence than the star. So I would say that p is a function that returns a pointer. However, if I put brackets around this, then the star gets higher precedence than the brackets. And then p would be a pointer to a function that returns something. Now, P can get the address of F, and this would be the call to F. Once P has been assigned the address of a function, this would be a call, right? Now, many of you might have seen in code, instead of P is assigned the address of F, you would see P is assigned F. And the compiler allows it. Why? Because it will perform an implicit cast. Put the address here. And you might always also have seen, instead of star p call, you might have also seen p call, right? This is because p would suffer a cast as well, right? The star p would be placed there by the compiler. So this p would be converted into star p implicitly, right? That's why it works. It's not that p that that p has this magic magic type that can accept the brackets. P cannot accept the brackets. Only star p can accept the brackets. But a compiler is smart enough to figure out that if you're putting the brackets there, right, the 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 star is a natural addition to it. All right. One interesting thing is the C++ reference type. And so it, it has the following differences from a pointer. There's no pointer arithmetic. I can't say P is assigned one, two, three, four. I can't say P plus K, right? But it's still the address of an object. And it has different cost rules compared to a pointer. That's all the difference, right? So. If we declare two reference, references, x and y, and then we say x is assigned 3, guess what? The compiler will allocate space for the number 3 automatically besides x. Besides x, right? So x is a variable, but the compiler will allocate space for the number 3 automatically and will 
assign the address of 3 of that dynamically allocated location into the variable x. So automatically you get, so initially you get x, and then automa uh, automatically 3 is allocated and x points to 3. When we say x plus equal 2, right, x will be automatically converted to its contents. So this is how the cast rules work, right? And y equals x will actually produce this. So now, if I assign to y, I also will change x. But there's sharing. There's not two separate, two separate locations. Any assignment to x will change y. Any assignment to y will change x. The more interesting aspect is when we call functions. Right? When we call a function that is declared like this, so let's say we have this declaration, and when I call f of x, y, x and y will be passed automatically as addresses. But x and y will be automatically passed as addresses even though x may not be. So, so let's say I call f a, b, and a, b are int. Right? I have int a, b as a declaration, and a, b have been initialized with something. Right? a is automatically converted to its address, b is automatically converted to its address. So whenever I have a function like this, I call it with two int variables, those values of those variables may change after the call. a and b are automatically converted to their address. Uh, if we call f with two constants, the compiler will automatically allocate space for two and three. So it will automatically allocate two variables Initialize them with values 2 and 3 and pass the addresses inside f. All right? So personally, I like this feature very much because it makes, uh, it, it makes the use of functions much more straightforward. You don't have to remember where do you put an address, where do you put the contents of something, right? And, uh, but, then, but then when J Java came along, one of the main criticisms, because Java was initially called C++, minus minus, right? Java was produced by stripping off features of C++ that were deemed unsafe. This was one feature that the creators of Java deemed unsafe. The uh, reference type was confusing, and they decided not to have explicit references, but to convert objects into references and basic types into their values. Uh, right and keep it keep it that way. Um, um, yeah. So so um, at the time when when um, uh, this appeared in C++, I uh, saw it as an advancement. It's uh, definitely an interesting um, an interesting kind of data. All right. Is this clear? Okay. Hierarchic data. So we can build up any kind of data. Right, uh, data inside data inside data inside data, and uh, you might occasionally see declarations like this. You might occasionally see declarations like this, right? So what's f, for instance? So f is a function. Actually, we have an animation here. So f is a function that returns a pointer to a function that returns a pointer to end, right? Just read from inside out. Okay? So now you're going to wonder, why the heck is this useful? That's not a correct question to ask. If you're designing a language, what would you have for your type system? You have to have something that doesn't constrain the user. It is true that probably as a C programmer, you would never go beyond two stars, right? Or so you would either have two stars, star, star, P, or star, P, array, right? It's very unlikely you'd go beyond that. The question is, as a language designer, do you want to constrain the user to a a uh, limited set of data types, or do you want to give the user the flexibility of inventing their own types, right? And you probably want to give the user the flexibility 
to uh, employ their own, uh, their own types, right? And then you have to come up with a type language. So C did a marvelous job at this, right? So, so the, the type language of C is extremely flexible and it is very, uh, very rigorous, right? It, it's, it's easy to compile, it's easy to, to, uh, to interpret. Um, so remember that. Um, let's, let's go to the next one, this one. Right, so A is a pointer, to a pointer, to an array of pointers, to, a, to arrays of ends. Right? So now, if you have this type, how do you initialize? You have to initialize every star, right? And actually, the principle is quite simple. You start with A, and in front of M alloc, oops, oh, I pressed the wrong thing. So, what's the type of A? How do we exp express the type of A? Well, I'm going to take this entire thing, remove A, and that's the type of A. So when I say A is assigned something, that type has to come as the cast here. So it's the declaration of ah, why, why, why. So it's the declaration of FIND from which you remove the identifier. That's the type of that identifier. That type has to come in here, right? The closest operator to A is star. For every star, we need to have an M alloc, right? So we have this M alloc, and what do we put inside here? We have to put size of something, and that something, I have to remove the first star. So if you look what's inside here, I took the type that I had in front and I removed the star that was closest to A, right? And then what we do next is move one star from the right-hand side into the left-hand side, right? So this star gets moved here. This is what happens on the next line, right? And we have another MLOC. And of course, we remove one more star here. All right? And then I'm going to take this star and move it here. But before that, you know, since A is a pointer to something, I may want to initialize star A plus 1 as well, not just star A. But um, so, so what, this is what I do. I take this guy here. What do I get when I do that? I already get an array. The array doesn't need to be allocated, has already been allocated because I have provided enough space here. Right? I have, I have room for 10 elements. So it makes sense to say star star A 0, right? And um, no, I have room for 3 elements, sorry, for 3 elements, not for 10 elements. So, so star star A 0, and I am going to remove. Uh, uh, this guy and this guy, right? So I'm left with one star and ten. And I have to put the star inside brackets because the star needs to be to have higher precedence than the array. If I remove the brackets, the array would take precedence over the star. Okay? And then what am I going to do? I'm going to take the star and move it out so you can see it here. But once I do that, I already have an array, right? So I have to index the array, and then I can put there an integer. All right? So remember, I will have to do an MLOC for every star, right? It's hierarchy going from the symbol out, OK? And every star, we take it from the right-hand side and move it to the left-hand side. All right, so uh, yeah, you'll figure it out. You'll have to look at this again, but it's a it's a very uh, it's a very nice principle at work here. 
Um, so this is pretty much uh, trying to explain what I just said. Uh, drop the A to obtain the cost, and then move one star from the right side to the left side. Okay, so that's pretty much how it works. Um, how about F? Right, how do we call F? Right, F um, is um, we call we want to call G right via F. So we call F. And then that returns a pointer, so we dereference the pointer, and we get the array, the address of a function, which we then call. All right. So this works exactly in the same way, right? So look at what happens here. So f from the type, the first thing that I can put next to f is the brackets. So here, the next put thing that I put, uh, I put next to f is the brackets. Then the next thing should be the star. So I put it here, right? And the next thing should be this thing. And at this point, I have a function call which returns a pointer to an end, right? Maybe it would have been a good idea to put a p here to collect that value. OK. We're going to talk more about this too. Prolog terms as data. So that's another type of data. Very different from the kind of data that we have in C. Uh, right? Terms represent tree-like symbolic data. It's very common in language processing. It's not very common in you know, operating systems, embedded systems, uh, and many types of application program, uh, pro programs where C is good for. The essential operation that we want to do on trees is pattern matching. And uh, unification is actually a generalized form of pattern matching. Uh, it's not common just to prologue. It's also common to, it's, it also appears in languages such, such as OCaml and Haskell. But prologue is untyped, whereas OCaml and Haskell are typed. So this is a very simple function that converts in uh, a syntax tree into a fully parenthesized expression, right? And this is a prolog program. And uh, the interesting aspect here is it works fine, but what if I, it works fine for the operators that it was designed for, plus, minus, star, and, and uh, division. What happens if a user who doesn't look at how the program has been constructed tries to use a to the power of b as an argument? Well, the program fails silently. It just doesn't, doesn't succeed, right? It doesn't give you an error message. It doesn't tell you what, that the usage is restricted to only the four operators that you see there, right? And this is the problem with an untyped language. There's no way to say here that these are the only types of expressions that we allow. That's because the language is untyped. What we would like to be able to do is restrict the operators to that, those kinds, those, those, uh, those four or five kinds. Okay? Uh, this is the scheme equivalent. Scheme is even worse, right? It sort of has type. Um, it sort of has symbolic data, but we, we don't have pattern matching. So we have to use these cumbersome functions, car, 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 cutter, cutter, right? Remember those? So cutter, car is what? The head of a list, right? So if in prologue I have h bar t in in a scheme, I would have a, uh, a list represented as A, B, right? And, or, or a, 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 B, right? So uh, uh, A would be car, and H would be car, equivalent of car. And the list containing B would be the kidder. All right? And then we have abbreviations. To get B, not the list containing B, I would need to have car, header of my list L, right? And this can be abbreviated as cutter. So we, I take the first C and the last R, and then I combine the middle letters together. Car and cutter come from what? Schemers. Uh, 
Where do the names Car and Kutter come from? Schemer is in the class. <coughs> from the two registers that would, ha would keep the head and the tail, on the IBM machine, on the IBM computer, uh, that on which the first Lisp interpreter was implemented, <coughs> right? So Scheme is a, a <coughs> grandchild of Lisp. Right, Lisp was implemented in the 50s on computers that would probably be as large as this room. And, uh, you know, as large as they were, they were less powerful than your phone, than your current phone. And they would have a limited number of registers. Lists would be implemented in such a way that these two registers, current cutter, would hold the head and the tail. And that's where, that's where the names come from. Uh, and they stuck. Uh, so we can have any combinations here. We can have names as uh, Kadidr, which would be the third, the second element of the, the third element in the list. Uh, Kadadr, Kadar. <laughs> you can come up with them. Uh, it sounds like Klingon, right? Um, right. So, 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 uh, um, yeah. So if we have uh, what kind of what kind of trees do we have here, right? So we will have uh, expressions like plus uh, star a b division c d, let's say, right? And we want a fully parenthesized um, um, fully parenthesized uh, uh, writing of this, and this would be done by this function. It doesn't have pattern matching, and it doesn't have a way of limiting the kinds of uh, structures that we can accept as input, right? Because it's also untyped. So this is a this is sort of Two examples of untyped languages. Let's look at the difference between uh, dynamic versus static type typing. Actually, prog is not untyped. It's dynamically typed. It means that we don't say what the type should be in the program, and the compiler doesn't care about that, but it will compile type checks inside the, ex the executable code. So at execution type, the type is checked, and the correct op operation is chosen. Right? which means that during execution, the data has to be packed with its type, and a type check has to be performed every time. That's uh, inefficient. So what the counterpart is static typing, where we say what the types are in the program, the compiler can check the types at compile time and not have to perform type checks at execution. But because all the type checking has to be performed automatically, it's, uh, the, the typing is restrictive. So the kind of types that we can specify in static typing is much less than the types that we can allow in dynamic type. Now, C goes uh, beyond that because it allows all sorts of costs. It just copies the bits uh, when it can't infer the, the types. But OCaml and Haskell are quite restrictive in the types of expressions that they allow. So often you will find yourself, as you write OCaml and, uh, and uh, Haskell programs, you would find yourself restricted because previously you could uh, execute your program at least and notice bugs. Now you can't even compile it, right? So the, the type checker is so restrictive, it will not allow things that you would find sort of uh, uh, obvious that should be allowed. Uh, but it, it goes down to what is computable as a type, right? And, and you'll see that your intuition is of types is much more relaxed than the computable <laughs> types that can be allowed. These would be similar programs in OCaml. And on the next slide, we're going to show Haskell. So here, first we perform a type declaration. All right? So what would be an expression? What would be the, the prologue expression A plus B times C plus D in this language would be uh, times bracket plus value A value B plus value, blah, 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 right? So this would be how we would express the same term. So you already start to see some advantages to Prolog because of that. But the advantage of this declaration is that we won't be able to pass 
into our toString function the wrong kind of terms. The compiler won't allow it now. The compiler can infer whether what we pass in there is the correct thing or not, and it will warn us at compile time, not even warn us, would issue an error. So the two string will look like this. Now we have pattern matching, right? And uh, this is how we, we work in, 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 in OCaml. This is declaration of a function. It is recursive. We have to say whether it's recursive or not. The name and the argument. There are no brackets. Brackets are uh, um, inferred automatically if necessary. So you see that I don't have to put a bracket in front of times. Uh, so if we have an expression of time plus left right, right, we match it with this and we produce the string open brace to string left, right, and this is the operator that we put in the middle to string right and so on and so forth, right. So it's relatively obvious what uh, we have here. The important thing is that this argument in our program will be restricted to only correct values. The compiler will enforce that. And uh, this is the old prologue program, just for comparison, right? So you can see the correspondence. It's pretty obvious. Um, the prologue program, of course, is easier to write, and it's easier to use. But it has the drawback of not being, uh, allowing, failing silently on wrong input, which is, which is misleading. What is the C equivalent of terms in Prolog? So, or, or let's say that, let's take this, let's take this OCaml type. This is an OCaml type. All right, so it says that foo is either nothing or is int of int or is pair of two ints or is string of strings, right? So in Prolog, we would have, right, int 3. In Prolog, we would have to use small letters. Here you can see that we have to use capitals. We, or we would have a pair, pair of 2 and 3. Or we would have a string of, let's say, x, y, z. Right? So these would be valid terms that would fit this description. The problem is that in Prolog, I could come up with many more terms as input, and the compiler would not be able to notice it. Right? Whereas here, the input to a function, the argument to a function would be restricted to this kind of terms. How do I model these terms in C? That's what we want to see now. Well, we have three types of terms, right? So we're going to define a structure. This is the type of the structure, which is either int or pair or string. And then there's data. This data will be placed in an union because we're not going to use the data simultaneously. If you're using the int, we're not going to use the pair. If we use the pair, we're not going to use the int. And so on, right? So we're going to have a union, and we're going to have the int right here, the pair right here, and the string right here. So obviously, if I'm going to set the type as 1, I should access foo.u.i. There should be a consistency condition there. If I am going to access the type for pairs, I should only use the pair. I should, right? So this means that I, I, as soon as I have set the type to be 1, Right, I should I should say that uh, let's say I have the structure s dot u dot I. I. This is what I should be setting. If my type is two, I should be setting s dot u dot pair. Right, and if my type is string is three, I should be setting s dot u dot str. Right, and there should be this consistency condition. I should not be using the the a type with the wrong field in the union. So now you see, in terms of, um, of, of uh, uh, usage, in OCaml I would be writing x is int 1. But in C, what do I have to do? I have to, let's say I declare x. I, I declare x. So here the structure will be allocated dynamically. And then I have to set the type. So I have to set the type, which is the int. And I have to set the value, the data corresponding to that type, the 1. 
if I have y being pair 2, 3, right, I have to set the type, and then I have to set the data corresponding to that type, which is two components, right? In Prolog, uh, I would have similar simplicity. X is bind to int 1, X is bind to pair 2, 3, right? So this is a type of data that is important, especially us, right? Processing language, doing language <laughs> processing, where we would benefit from this kind of structures a lot. Uh, and you notice at this point that the, the C equivalent is much more hairy. So it is a good thing to have this type of data in some languages, right? Uh, you might know that, for instance, Prolog is not a very efficient language. OCaml is a very efficient language. So OCaml is the language of choice nowadays for many language developers, those who develop new languages. They try to do it in OCaml. Um, it's, it's, it's much easier. Um, and uh, uh, Prolog is even simpler because it has more advanced pattern matching, even though the drawback is that that cannot be compiled very easily. But we have, we'll, we'll see an interpreter in about 30 lines of code um, uh, next time. So, um, yeah, so that's going to be <laughs> uh, the uh, really uh, powerful um, aspect of Prolog. So this is the equivalent of Husk in Haskell, right? Just for your information, similar declaration, similar code. Haskell has equational programming, so you see that it has one line of definition similar to one rule for every case, right? But it is typed. It is typed, which means that we cannot accept in here anything that is outside of the type. All right, so we're going to stop here. I'm going to do Python next time, um, right? And um, we're going to also do next time semantics and the prolog interpreter for a simple imperative language. Uh, thanks. See you next time. <laughs>